deep in the Indian Ocean, roughly 700 kilometers east of Madagascar, lies the remote and peaceful French island of La Réunion. One would think that this would be a place to escape the Second World War, but on the contrary, the Battle of Reunion Island is like a microcosm of what France and its people are going through. It's a story of duty and honor, of resistance and shifting loyalties, of fragmentation and of reunion. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II special episode about the Battle of Reunion Island. Now, I know we, and even back in the Great War, we've always had the rule that we do not do specials about individual battles. But you know, my show, my rules. And we are doing this one. Historically, the French crown claimed the island from the Portuguese all the way back in 1638 when moving into the international spice trade. Since the isle was on the route to India and what were known as the Spice Islands, it was a good stopping point for ships coming around the Horn of Africa. Dedicated to the French monarchy as Ile de Bourbon, the name was changed to Ile de Napoleon after the French Revolution. Then, after the French defeat in the Battle of Trafalgar, it was briefly occupied by the British, who took the opportunity to snatch up some colonial possessions. Although the island was then reunited with the French, the theme of changing regimes and foreign invasion would eventually return once more. So. On June 22nd, 1940, in this war, an armistice with Germany is signed and the French Republic falls and Radio Mauritius broadcasts these events to Reunion Island. Like all of France's colonies and overseas possessions, La Réunion is now left with a choice. Either declare loyalty to the new Vichy government of Philippe Pétain or continue the war for the exiled government. To decide its future, Reunion Governor Pierre Aubert arranges a meeting with the local nobility. Although Aubert is himself a supporter of Pétain and has personally pledged fealty to his Révolution Nationale, the decision is not just his to make. Reunion Island seems to have little strategic importance to the war and basically no defenses or military value. Without big natural harbors and with lots of volcanic mountain ranges, Life on the island revolves around its sugar plantations. Much of the population are Malays, Anamites, Indians, and Chinese, and many of the latter have just recently immigrated to escape the Sino-Japanese War. So loyalty can be tricky to figure. Does a French national hero like Pétain represent the will of the French people? Or if not, then what gives men like Charles de Gaulle the right to proclaim themselves the rightful government of France? And while Aubert is considered a moderate, others in his government are far more vocal about their allegiances. Raoul Nativelle of the Conseil General openly denounces the armistice and swears to continue the fight. Jean-Jacques Pillet, on the other hand, the director of Aubert's cabinet, is a hardcore pétonist. There is also the British consul, who offers to pay for Aubert and his government if Reunion chooses to join the Free French. That offer might have actually tipped the scales, since turning over the island to one or another French government is one thing, but surrendering the island to a British or foreign authority is simply unacceptable. After much debating, Aubert and the majority of his council choose to remain loyal to Vichy France. Pillet, in charge of security, immediately goes to work increasing propaganda and censoring press outlets. A militia is organized to patrol the streets, and a secret police begins watching over public gatherings and workers' clubs. Those who openly refuse to follow the government's lead are ousted or arrested, among them even the general secretary and the president of the Colonial Commission. Every anti-Vichy activity is either fined or is sent to be tried in criminal court. Of course, mirroring the internal struggle of collaboration and resistance in mainland France, here too, this sparks resistance. Low-profile cells of pro-Gaullists begin operating in the underground in the island's major towns. The communists under their leader, Léon de Lepervanche, begin organizing the workers in the factories. Even royalty is involved in the person of Vinh San, the former emperor of Vietnam. Well, the Vietnamese part of French Indochina. Vin Song was exiled to Reunion in 1916 after staging an unsuccessful rebellion against French colonial rule. Now a hobby radio operator, he begins relaying international news to the resistance. Yet months pass without any further developments until 1942. 
After losing Singapore in February, the British Eastern Fleet withdraws first to the Maldives and then to their East African bases. And now the eyes of the warring nations begin to fall on French possessions in the region that remained loyal to the Vichy regime, primarily Madagascar. Allied planners fear the Japanese could pressure the French into handing over control of that island like they had done with Indochina. And a Japanese harbor just east of Africa and on the route to India would be a strategic nightmare. Already there are reports of Japanese midget submarines engaging Allied ships in the area. Then on May the 5th, Operation Ironclad begins, with the British invading Diego Suarez in Madagascar's north. When Reunion Radio reports the attack, anti-Allied sentiment on the island intensifies. The government condemns the heavy bombardment of Diego Suarez as unprovoked terrible aggression by the British against the peaceful islanders. Once more, Aubert holds an emergency meeting with his council because the offensive against Madagascar has immediate repercussions for reunion, as all of its shipping and communications connections with the African mainland are now cut. The Defense Council thinks that a communications disruption can only mean one thing, invasion. Reunion, however, is basically helpless against attack. The only military on the island consists of three officers, 11 NCOs, a doctor, and around 270 troops, of which maybe two dozen could be considered professional soldiers. The entrance to the outdated coastal artillery is blocked by an out of order sign, and there are no other defensive strong points. Nevertheless, the council drafts a plan. They'll scuttle the biggest ship they can find in the main harbor of Lepore to block the main access route. Then they will evacuate the capital Saint-Denis for fear of a similar offshore bombardment like Madagascar's. An effort is made to restore the coastal batteries to working order. Meanwhile, sentries are placed all along the coastline to scan the ocean for approaching ships. In the following days, Saint-Denis becomes a ghost town as the inhabitants flee towards inland areas. Schools are closed and all lights blacked out at night. But the months pass and no invasion comes. On September 18th, the council meets again. As people begin returning to the cities, Governor Aubert becomes uncertain of his plan of a glorious last stand. So he revises it. The resistance will be purely symbolic. They would exchange a few shots with the invading British and then surrender. So afterwards, no one could say that they hadn't done their duty to the fatherland or motherland, whatever you want to call it. A week later, the council declares Saint-Denis an open city to spare its inhabitants any military confrontation. The governor, his staff, and the majority of the armed forces relocate to Helbor. Again, the months pass until... November 6, 1942, the radio announces that after six months of fighting on Madagascar, a ceasefire is in effect. Things now begin to happen. On the night of November 26th and 7th, the destroyer Leopard leaves Mauritius with a small force of 74 commandos heading for reunion. By 11 p.m., Leopard arrives off the coast. Under the command of Lieutenant Moreau, they send out two small boats to find a landing space. At 2.30 a.m., a lookout spots Leopard, and reports start coming in about strange men wandering the streets of Saint-Denis. Alarms ring, and the governor is alerted at roughly the same time Moreau's main force is landing. A few shots ring out in the night, but no real resistance is encountered. By morning, Saint-Denis is declared conquered. However, after much confusion during the night, Aubert has received the news that this attack was not led by a British warship as expected, but by a French destroyer. Now that kind of changes everything. So Aubert sends out his secretary to meet with Moreau and says they have no intention of fighting the free French forces. Moreau says, cool, but he also says they've already brought in a successor to replace Aubert. Over the radio, both sides explain the situation to the public, asking for peace and reconciliation on the island. Now, in theory, the story could have ended right there, but years of disunion and political radicalization have deepened animosities. Immediately after the Free French Land, the communist cells become active. Workers arm themselves and storm the town hall of Saint-Denis, taking the mayor hostage and vote their leader, Le Pervenche, as the new president. Then they march to the batteries at the shore. Their defenders, however, are hardcore pro determined to put up a fight. Throughout the night, the two groups clash. 
In the confusion, the officer of the battery also opens fire on Leopard. This is bad news because Leopard's commander is already anxious. News has come in about Axis submarines operating in the channel of Mozambique, and a single French destroyer would be attempting an easy target. Nervously, the commander radios an ultimatum to the defenders. Surrender in the coming hours, or they will shell the factories to pieces. The commando operation could have easily gone sideways, but catastrophe is averted. Without public support, the coastal battery surrenders, and the communists withdraw. And by the 30th of November, the Battle of La Réunion is over. In a way, Leopard's ultimatum has made things easier. Reunion's surrender is formally declared as having saved the island from bombardment. This way, military honor is kept intact. Over the coming days, the Gaullists take over the government, and the hardcore Pitonists are discreetly transferred onto Leopard to escape public retaliation. And that is basically it. Reunion will face some struggles over the coming years. The plan of blocking their only semi-major harbor seriously backfires, as it is then tough to supply the islanders with imports. Also, there are many feuds among the population that take a long time to cool down. To this day, though, the islanders remember the invasion as Leopard Day. But what happens to exiled Vin San, I hear you ask? Well, he takes the opportunity to get off the island. In fact, he joins Leopard as a low-ranking radio officer. And then he will serve with the Free French Army until the end of the war. All's well that ends well. Hey, if you want to see another episode that's about something really interesting... And interesting, and that one that isn't even a tangential part of this war, then here's a special we did about the Ecuadorian-Peruvian War. And for more tangential or irrelevant or just plain awesome specials like this one, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com because it is that what finances this. See you next time. Mm -hmm.